Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Center Point Community Church in Winter Haven, Florida. I'm Pastor Dwayne Hunt, and it's my privilege to welcome you here on this blessed Easter Sunday. It's such a joy that we get to celebrate Easter with you. And just as the angels gave the message to the women at the tomb that first Easter Sunday morning, He is not here. He is risen just as He told you He would. Come and see the place. So today we're going to do just that together. We're going to look at, at the scriptures in the Gospel of John chapter 20. I encourage you right now to go ahead and pull out a Bible so that you'll be ready when we read the scriptures in just a few moments. Um, I'm recording this before, but if you're viewing this, it is after our first, perhaps our only, who knows, drive-in service for Easter Sunday. We are totally convinced and... Uh, uh, concerned about watching for people's safety and health. Absolutely. So we're honoring all the guidelines. But we are also totally convinced that worshiping Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday is an essential service. So that's why we're moving forward and we're very, very excited about it. Some of you may have seen this meme all over Facebook and all over social media, but it's really true, huh? It's like, and just like that, my pastor was a televangelist. Uh-oh, never aimed to do that. Who thought we would be here, but now we find ourselves in strange times. And today, because of the driving service, not only am I now a televangelist, I'm also a radio personality. You got that right, because we broadcast our drive-in service through FM channel 87.8. So, hey, Dwayne is now a televangelist and a radio personality. How weird is that? So who could possibly have imagined all the things we're facing and how the relative importance of other items in our life have, have sort of changed because of the quarantining and the social distancing. I agree with this graph. The number one thing that didn't change is coffee. I need coffee. I hope you do too. The internet was already important, but wow, more so. And how about those all-important sweatpants? Hmm. People now don't need their cars as much, and lots of guys have quit shaving. So, lots of things change. Well, this crazy virus, who could possibly have imagined or seen this coming? That our booming economy would be stifled, that we would be questioning the validity of handshaking in the future, that schools would be closed in many states for the rest of the year. Sure, they're going virtually online, but who would have seen this coming? Who would have seen the closing of so many businesses? Just last week, we got a brand new magazine in the mail. And as I was thumbing through it, I had to laugh because absolutely everything in this magazine was completely outdated and irrelevant. It was like, wow, when they took this to the publisher, it was this way and now everything is completely different. Everything is completely changed. I don't know about you, but this week we got our March 31st Roth IRA statements in the mail. Hmm. Not pretty. Not the way we want things changing, right? New York Governor Andrew Cuomo had a press conference back on April 1st, actually. But here's some things he said. He said, as a society, beyond just this immediate situation, we should start looking forward to understand how this experience is going to change us or how it should change us, because this is going to be transformative. It is going to be transformative on a personal basis, on a social basis, and on a system basis. We're never going to be the same again. We're not going to forget what happened here, the fear that we have, the anxiety that we have. That's not just going to go away. So the question, when do we get back to normal? I don't think we get back to normal, Governor Cuomo said. I think we get back, or we get to a new normal, right? Like we see in so many facets of society right now. So we will be in a different place. Our challenge is to make sure that transformation and that change is positive and not negative. Well, I think in many ways, Governor Cuomo is right that we're in a transformative moment and things will never be the same again. And whether you agree with how everybody else sees things or not, I think we all know we're going to have some new normals. Well, today we want to look 
at the story of Easter from the Gospels. Again, John's Gospel, chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 1 to 18 because the resurrection is a truly transformative experience. This Easter season, we've been looking at what I call Easter FaceTime. FaceTime with Jesus. People who had one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one encounters with Jesus Christ, uh, seeing him face-to-face, -face, having FaceTime with Jesus, particularly from the, the Gospel of John. And today we're going to see the story from the Gospels of Mary Magdalene that first Easter Sunday morning when she had this precious FaceTime with Jesus. John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 1 to 31, actually 18. And uh, if you're at home and able to do so, would you please stand? I'd like to encourage people to stand in reverence because this is the Word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside he saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father, Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Let's pray together as we begin this time of Bible study. God, we just thank you for the joy of Easter, the new normal that we have a Savior who died for our sins, who was buried, and who is risen and alive again. It's a brand new normal, and Mary was the first to know it. God, capture our hearts, our imaginations, and our spirits with the reality of the Easter message right now. Change our lives, just like Easter changed the world, changed history, and changed eternity forever and ever. Change us today through the resurrection, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Mary Magdalene. Just who was this Mary? Now, Mary Magdalene appears in the crucifixion and resurrection story in all four Gospels. But apart from that, we really read of her only specifically in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, 8, verses 1 to 3. Though Jesus' named apostles were all men, it is clear that there were many women who were key followers of Jesus. 
It is also clear that Jesus did not treat women as others in his culture did, but he treated them with dignity as people of worth. Mary of Magdala was an early follower of Jesus who certainly deserves to be called an apostle. She was from the village of Magdala. And here's a map right here. You can see that Magdala right here on the map is on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Magdala at the time was a fishing village at the base of Mount Arbel. Let me show you that. This is how it looks. Again, you're up on Mount Arbel, and right here is the current city of Magdala cities. <laughs> too, too overstating the case. It's a small little village with some ruins. But in those days, it was a fishing village on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, and it was the most important settlement on that sea until Tiberius was established in the first century AD. Excavations have uncovered a rare synagogue that was in use here even during the days of Jesus. So who was Mary? She was an energetic, impulsive, caring woman. She not only traveled with Jesus, but she also contributed to the needs of the entire group. Mary is not identified as the sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet. It's just not said. She is also not identified as the woman taken in adultery, whom Jesus saves from stoning. And despite the musical Jesus Christ Superstar when I was a kid, there was no romantic relationship between Mary and Jesus. But this we know, Mary's life had been miraculously changed by Jesus when he drove out seven demons from her. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, because she's from Magdala, from whom seven demons had come out. In every glimpse of the Gospels, we see Mary, that we see of Mary, we see that she was acting out of her deep love and appreciation for what Jesus had done for her. Her faith was not theoretical. Her faith was not complicated. She was just eager to believe and, and to obey and to understand everything that Jesus had said to her. Mary was at the foot of the cross when Jesus gave his life for us on Good Friday. At the end of Good Friday, Mary followed Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus to the tomb, making sure she knew exactly where it was. Uh, Saturday night, it was Mary, along with some other women, buying and getting together burial spices. And Sunday morning, it was Mary at the empty tomb. And she was the very first person to see Jesus alive again. Isn't that amazing? The very first. She never expected Jesus' body, bodily resurrection but she was overjoyed to discover it. Now, why was Mary first? Well, we don't know for certain why Jesus picked her, except she must have been very special. We also believe that this shows very clearly that Jesus elevated the position of women. In their culture, they would never have put the women first, but with Jesus, he did. Also, the fact that Mary and the early witnesses, a group of women, saw Jesus again before any of the guys did. Uh, it also shows us the truth of the resurrection. Because in the courts of the time, a woman's testimony was not considered legally um, binding. So if the gospel writers were making up a story because it wasn't true and they wanted to invent some religion, they would never have put these details together. They would never have said it was the women. They would have changed that. But the reason they say it is the women, it is Mary, is because it was. It's factual. It's incredible. Over the past year and a half of Mary's life, perhaps two, Mary Magdalene had come one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and had face time with him on many occasions. She was one of his most trusted followers. But she's the very first to have face time with Jesus after his resurrection Easter Sunday morning. Her face time with Jesus on Easter was the first of the new normal for all believers. And that's what we're going to look at today. Mary Magdalene experiences the first new normal, showing us the new normal for all Christ followers, even us today. 
Number one, Mary was the first to leave it all at Jesus' empty tomb for the living hope of the resurrection. Mary was the very first one. She left it all at the empty tomb. Now, I'm a lover of history, and sometimes when you love history, you visit important historical sites or tombs of famous or important people. I've been to Grant's tomb in New York City. I've been to Washington's tomb in Valley Forge. I've seen Thomas Jefferson's tomb at Monticello. Um, one day I hope to visit Abraham's tomb in Hebron in Israel. But you know what? Of all the world's religions, only Christianity stands apart with this. We have no tomb that contains Jesus' remains. There is no tomb. We don't worship a tomb. We don't visit a grave. We leave everything at an empty tomb. So Mary was the first to leave it all at Jesus' tomb. Let's look at some things she left behind by looking at how she was coming into Easter and how she was coming out. So going into Easter, we're told early on the first day of the week, verse 1, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the, the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. And verse 11, But Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, they, and she said to the angels, They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. Going to the tomb that morning, Mary went to, to properly bury Jesus. Here's a picture of tombs as they were in the culture of the times. Jesus was hastily laid in a receiving area where the body could be prepared, but because it was um, before the Sabbath and they had to hurry, and it was a high Sabbath because of the Passover, they just hurriedly anointed Jesus and left it behind. But Mary came to finish the job and do it right. So in those days, they would finish um, burial, and then they would put, they were usually more people in the tomb than just one. They would place them in these different burial niches. So, and then after about a year, they would come and collect the bones and put them in what was called an ossuary box. So how did Mary come? Well, she came with dread, with fear, with disappointment, with pain. When it says in verse 11 that she stood outside the tomb crying and weeping, the word is a Greek word which means she was weeping out loud. There weren't just little tiny tears rolling down her cheeks. She was wailing out loud uncontrollably and uncontainably in her audio grief. They have taken the Lord from me, and I don't know where they put him. So she's fearful. She's grieving. She's confused. She's in shock. She's numb. She's just shaking her head in disbelief and helplessness and hopelessness. And sometimes all of those things make us blind and keep us from seeing the Jesus who's standing right there in front of us. And some of those very same things deafen us from hearing Jesus' voice as he speaks his word to us. Now, after her FaceTime with Jesus, she left full of faith, Comforted, clear-eyed, encouraged, engaged, full of peace and resolve. She went from hopeless to hope. And you see, that's what Jesus came to do for all of us. To take us in our darkness, in our grief, in our fear. And he took all those things on the cross for us. And in the tomb he was buried for us. And he rose again. And Romans 6 tells us that we too are crucified with Christ. And on the cross we... We put on Jesus all of our sin and shame and suffering and sorrow. He bore that also that we could be forgiven. And like Jesus was buried in Jesus, we too are buried. All those things we put in the grave. And on Easter Sunday, Jesus rose again. And in Jesus, we too rise again. We leave behind a life of hopelessness for a life of hope. Paul says in Ephesians 2, before Christ, we were separated from God, lost. We were without God and without hope in the world. But after Easter, we are with Christ. We are with God and with hope. 
Mary left all that stuff behind at Jesus' empty tomb for the living hope. In 1 Peter 1, Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We don't have to live in fear. Boy, is, isn't this day and age that we don't know what's happening? We don't know. I mean, look at Mary said, we don't know. I don't know. There's so much we don't know right now, but we do know that Jesus rose again. We can leave it all behind at an empty tomb. Why well, carry it around anymore? Second, Mary was the first to listen to the risen Jesus call her name and to look into his risen face. It's just so amazing. Verse 14. As, as the angel said, Woman, who are you looking for? Why are you crying? And then she realizes Jesus is there. She turned around and saw Jesus, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. And Jesus asked her two questions. Woman, why are you crying? And two, who is it that you are looking for? And she just thought he was the gardener and said, Sir, if you've carried him away, please tell me where you put him so that I can take him from you. And then Mary had an experience that everybody who loves Jesus has. And that's Mary hears Jesus' voice. Simply say her name. Mary. When Mary listened to the risen Christ call her name, it's like she spiritually awoke she came out of her tomb and rose again. And she went toward him and said, Rabboni, which means my teacher. It's an affectionate term. So once she heard the voice of Jesus calling her name, then she could look into the face of the risen Jesus. She's the first person, the very first one who got this new normal of people who love Jesus being able to listen to the resurrected Jesus call your name and look into his face. Blaise Pascal, a French scientist and theologian, said, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. We all have this hope in our spirits, in our hearts, in our lives, and we're waiting. We're waiting. God is waiting for us to listen to his voice calling our name. When, in verse 16, Jesus says to her, Mary, it says she turned toward him and cried out. The word turn there means to completely change directions. She didn't about face. She did a 180. One of my favorite bands is the Christian rock band, Switchfoot. And they get their name from a surfing term, which means to take a new stance on your surfboard so that you're going in the other direction. I don't know if you've ever seen a surfer doing that, but they pivot, it's, they switch feet. And for Mary, when she heard Jesus' voice, it was a Switchfoot. She turned. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd in John 10. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Dear friends, Mary was the first to listen to the risen Jesus calling her name and to look at his risen face. What a joy. But he calls your name too, because he loves you. He doesn't want to let you go. He doesn't want you to choose to go away from him. He calls your name. Listen to the voice of Jesus calling your name. And when you turn, you can look into his risen face. The power of the resurrection. Old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Well, very quickly, let's continue. Mary was the first, and this is a new norm, to learn and understand the truth about the resurrection. You see, here's something that we often miss. Jesus 
had told his disciples over and over again that this was going to happen. But Mary had some learning to do, as did all of them and as do all of us, right? Jesus had told them over and over again. So she acknowledges him, Rabboni, which means my teacher. And he, she acknowledges he's my teacher. She still has so much to know and so much to learn, but she was the first to understand what Jesus had said. Way back in Matthew 16, after Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God at Caesarea Philippi, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised again. He told them. That's when Peter said, may it never be, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He told them again, coming down from the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus told them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. It was clear he was going to rise. And he continued, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. Later again, as Jesus was making his final trip to Jerusalem, he said to the twelve and to the, the women who were traveling with them, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will rise to life. So we're like, why weren't all of Jesus' followers at the tomb watching for that moment, you know? It's like a famous thing to do when you're in Hawaii on the island of Maui, is go up to Haleakala, and it's freezing cold up there because it's over 10,000 feet, even in Hawaii. You go up there early, early in the morning, and you, you get your blankets, and you wait for the sunrise. And you see that sunrise coming up over the islands, and it's extraordinary because you know the sun is rising. How come Jesus' followers, the apostles, Mary Magdalene, the other women, how come they didn't keep watch? It's the third day. We should be there at the tomb watching because Jesus said he would do this. Jesus always keeps his word. The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he would do. The same is true for us. We have a lot of learning to do to understand more and more about Jesus. And he, he tells us in his word. So let's learn from his word. Let's learn that everything he tells us will come, will come to pass, will come true. Number four, Mary was the first to lead out in going and telling. I love what Jesus said to her. Don't hold on to me, for I have yet not returned to the Father. Instead, go to my brothers and tell them. Mary's response as commanded by Jesus, was to go and tell. Now, Jesus had already been training his disciples to use that, right? Go and tell. And it had already been part of the plan. Later, Jesus gives the Great Commission. You know, all authority on heaven and on earth is given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always. These are the things that Jesus said. These are real. They're unchangeable. They're certain. But Mary was the very first one to be able to share the news. Jesus is alive. Before Peter. Before any of the apostles. Mary was first. She was the one to lead out and going and telling. And she says very simply... I have seen the Lord. Sometimes Christians, we minimize the power of a simple testimony of how we have seen Jesus in our lives, how we have a, an intimate relationship to him. So go and tell, and literally Jesus' command is keep going. Continue going and urgently tell of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. One final statement. Mary was the first to let go of Jesus and wait for his return. Jesus said to Mary, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Years ago, I was really puzzled. Why would Jesus say, Don't touch me? That's not really what he's saying here. 
What he's saying here, it's a word which means to seize and hold on to and not let go. I think Mary was so excited to see Jesus alive. She just grabbed onto his legs and his feet and wouldn't let go. And I don't think, I don't think Jesus rebuked her. I think he smiled and said, Mary, Mary, don't hold on to me. I have more people to show myself to. I have more to do. I have to ascend to the Father but I'm coming back for you. Mary was the first to let go of Jesus and wait for his return. We get to do that too. See, these are her new normals, but they're new normals for us too. Jesus, we're told, after he appeared to his apostles over a period of 40 days, he ascended into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Seated because his work is done. It's all accomplished. It is finished. Tetelestai in Greek. It's done. But Jesus also has promised us he's coming back. So he says, Mary, don't hold on to me or stop holding on. Let go, Mary, because I still have other, I still have to go up to the Father. But here's the truth. I'm coming again. Jesus had told his disciples on Monday, Thursday night, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in John 17, as he's praying in the garden for his disciples, and not just his current disciples, but all who would believe in, the, in him through them, that's us. Jesus prays, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you love me before the creation of the world. Jesus wants us to be with him. And he's coming back. When he ascended into heaven, he told the people standing there, this same, or the angels told the people standing there, this same Jesus, whom you have seen going into heaven, will come in like manner as you have seen him. See, Jesus is coming again. So Mary had to let go so that Jesus could continue and complete his plan. Not Mary. Mary's plans would have been, let's just stay here, Jesus. And that's good. That's a good thing, a beautiful thing. And Jesus smiled. But he said, no, I'm going to come back for you, Mary, or you're going to come up and be with me. And that's the truth for all of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus. Mary was the first to leave all her pain and sorrow and suffering at an empty tomb. Friends, will you do that today? Will you take all the sin and sorrow in your lives and all the grief and confusion and disbelief and leave it at the empty tomb? Will you, like Mary, be the first to listen to the risen Jesus call your name so that you can look into his face? Will you learn more about the, the resurrection and its importance by living it out, by trusting in the word of God and everything he says to us? And will you be one of the first? Will you continue to lead out by going and telling others of the resurrection and by letting go of of Jesus, so that because we know we, we, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Now, Jesus didn't leave us, He sent us the Holy Spirit. But one day, Jesus is coming again, and what a glorious day that will be. 1 Peter 3 18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5. Christ's love compels us, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised to life. Why is the resurrection so important? It's so important because it's the central truth of Christianity. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we wouldn't be dating our calendars 2020, right? It's all based on on the validity of who Jesus Christ was and the greatest day in history that changed everything. But today, Jesus wants to completely change your life and my life. Whether you've never let Jesus into your heart or whether you've been following him and fallen back and not been true to him, whether you just need a deeper walk with him, maybe you've been overwhelmed by all the coronavirus and everything that's going on in this crazy world, Jesus invites you to come and have some face time with the risen Savior and Lord. 
Romans tells us that believing in the resurrection defines you and me being a Christian. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Today, do you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord? Will you confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead? Will you receive him, believe him, confess and repent, do that switch foot like Mary did, give your lives to Christ, and make sure that that we're living for him, not us, that he died for all, that we would, would not keep living for ourselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Would you just pray with me, and then I have a closing story. God, I just pray for everybody who's watching this today, that you would show yourself to us, that you would call our names, that we would hear your voice calling our names, that we would look into your face and be forever changed. May Mary's new normal be the new normal that we also experience today. Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Please, Lord, come into my life. Show me the power of the resurrection. I need the power of the resurrection to change me and to make me all that you want me to be, a new creation. Help me to live forward, not in fear, but in faith. Not in hopelessness, but in hope. Thank you, Jesus. I accept you as my Savior and Lord. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in closing today, I did not write this, but I wish I did. It's written by a pastor's wife, a former public school teacher, a stay-at-home mom, and a homeschooling mom. Her name is Christy Bother, and she wrote, uh, with a nod to Dr. Seuss, How the Virus Stole Easter. "'Twas late in 19 when the virus began, bringing chaos and fear to all people, each land. People were sick, hospitals full, doctors overwhelmed, no one in school. As winter gave way to the promise of spring, the virus raged on, touching peasant and king. People hid in their homes from the enemy unseen. They YouTubed and Zoomed, social distanced and cleaned. April approached, and churches were closed. There won't be an Easter, the world supposed. There won't be church services, and egg hunts are out. No reason for new dresses when we can't go about. Holy Week started as bleak as the rest. The world was focused on masks and on tests. Easter can't happen this year, they proclaimed. Online and at home, it just won't be the same. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, the days came and went. The virus pressed on, it just wouldn't relent. The world woke Sunday and nothing had changed. The virus still menaced, the people estranged. Poo poo to the saints, the world was grumbling. They're finding out now that no Easter is coming. They're just waking up, and I know what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two, and then all the saints will cry out, boo-hoo. That noise, said the world, would be something to hear. So it paused, and the world put a hand to its ear. And it did hear a sound coming through all the skies. It started down low, then it started to rise. But the sound wasn't depressed. Why, this sound was triumphant. It couldn't be so, but it grew with abundance. The world stared around, popping its eyes. Then it shook. What it saw was a shocking surprise. Each saint in each nation, the tall and the small, was celebrating Jesus in spite of it all. It hadn't stopped Easter from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the world, with its life quite stuck in quarantine, stood puzzling and puzzling, just how can it be? It came without bonnets, it came without bunnies, it came without egg hunts, cantatas, or money. Then the world thought of something it hadn't before. Maybe Easter, it thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Easter, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, the story's not done. What will you do 
will you share with that one or two or more people needing hope in this night? Will you share of the source of your life in this fight? The churches are empty, but so is the tomb. And Jesus is victor over death, doom, and gloom. So this year at Easter, let this be our prayer as the virus still rages all around everywhere. May the world see hope when it looks at God's people. May the world see the church not as a building or a steeple. May the world find faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. May the world find joy in a time of dejection. May 2020 be known as the year of survival. But not only that, let's start a revival. Amen. And with that today, I want to thank you for joining this video teaching segment here at Center Point Church. And I want to wish you and your family a very, very blessed Easter because he's not here in the tomb. He is risen just as he said.